section eighteen of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson ninth day may the twenty third there was a great crowd as usual in court this morning long before the commencement of the proceedings the duke of wellington the earl of albemarle lord donamore lord dufferin lord feversham sir j packington mr harcourt vernon general peel mr tolomac mr s warren and other members of parliament were present the learned judges lord campbell mr baron alderson and mr justice cresswell took their seats upon the bench at about ten o'clock and the prisoner having been placed at the bar the examination of witnesses for the defence was resumed no alteration has taken place in the prisoner's demeanour counsel for the crown the attorney-general mr e james q c mr wellsby mr bodkin and mr huddleston for the prisoner mr sergeant shee mr grove q c mr gray and mr keneally mr j b ross examined by mr grove i am house surgeon to the london hospital i recollect a case of tetanus being brought into the hospital on the twenty second of march last a man aged thirty-seven was brought in about half-past seven o'clock in the evening he had had one paroxysm in the receiving room his pulse was rapid and feeble his jaws were closed and fixed there was an expression of anxiety about the countenance the features were sunken he was unable to swallow and the muscles of the abdomen and the back were somewhat tense after he had been in the ward about ten minutes he had another paroxysm and his body became arched it lasted about a minute he was afterwards quieter for a few minutes and then he had another attack and died the whole lasted about half an hour there was an inquest held on the body it was examined and no poison was found i think tetanus was the cause of death there were three wounds on the body two at the back of the right elbow each about the size of a shilling and one on the left elbow about the size of a sixpence the man had had those wounds for twelve or sixteen years they were old chronic indurated ulcers circular in outline the edges thickened and rounded and covered with a white coating without any granulation i am unable to say what was the origin of those ulcers but i have seen other wounds like them i have seen old chronic syphilitic wounds like them in other places those wounds were the only things which would account for tetanus cross-examined by the attorney-general i ascertained that poultices had been applied to the wounds a day or two before but i am not certain as to the exact time the man's wife had objected to their application they were made of linseed meal the man's jaws were fixed so as to render him perfectly incapable of swallowing anything he said he had first been taken with symptoms of lockjaw at eleven o'clock as he told me at dinner but as he told my colleague at breakfast he was able to speak but could not open the jaw that is a symptom of tetanus there were symptoms of rigidity about the abdominal and lumbar muscles he did not say how long he had felt that rigidity i gathered that some other medical man a surgeon had seen him in the afternoon before he came to the hospital but i am not certain as to that he was a labouring man have you any doubt that the disease had been coming on since morning no doubt at all the sores were ugly sores of a chronic character ulcers there was an integument which connected the two on the right arm so that they would be likely to run into one another the wounds continued under the skin and there were no signs of healing they had the appearance of old neglected sores they were at the seat of the ulnar nerve a very sensitive nerve that which is commonly called the funny bone i believe he had successive paroxysms all the afternoon before he came to the hospital i think his attack arose from tetanus my opinion is founded upon the facts that he had had wounds that he had died of spasms that he had lockjaw that the muscles of the abdomen and back were rigid and that he complained of pain in the stomach 
I did not hear the account of the symptoms of Cook's death. An affection of the ulnar nerve was peculiarly liable to produce tetanus. Re-examined by Mr. Grove. Strychnine was suspected in that case. The nerves of the tongue are very delicate, as are also those of the throat and forces. I have read descriptions of tetanus in the books. The case described by Mr. Gay was idiopathic, having been caused by a cold. An injury to any delicate nerve would decidedly be a cause of tetanus. Mr. Reiner's Mantel, examined by Mr. Gray. I am a house surgeon at the London Hospital. I saw the case mentioned by Mr. Ross, and his statement with respect to the symptoms is correct. In my judgment, the disease of which the patient died was tetanus, produced by the sores on the arms. Dr. Wrightson, examined by Mr. Keneally. I was a pupil of Liebig at Gießen. I am a teacher of chemistry in a school in Birmingham. I have studied the nature and acquired a knowledge of poisons, and I have been engaged by the Crown in the detection of poison in a prosecution. I have experimented upon strychnia. I have found no extraordinary difficulty in the detection of strychnia. It is certainly to be detected by the usual tests. I have tested and discovered it both pure and mixed with impure matter after decomposition has set in. I have detected it in a mixture of bile, bilious matter, and putrefying blood. Strychnia can be discovered in the tissues. I have discovered it in the viscera of a cat, in the blood of one dog, and in the urine of another dog, both of them having been poisoned by strychnia. I am of opinion that strychnia does not undergo decomposition in the act of poisoning or in entering into the circulation. If it underwent such a change, if it were decomposed, I should say it would not be possible to discover it in the tissues. It might possibly be changed into a substance in which, however, it would still be detectable. It can be discovered in extremely minute quantities indeed. When I detected it in the blood of a dog, I had given the animal two grains. To the second dog, I gave one grain, and I detected it in the urine. Half a grain was intended to have been given to the cat, but a considerable portion of it was lost. Assuming that a man was poisoned by strychnine, and if his stomach was sent to me for analysation within five or six days after death, I have no doubt that I should find it generally. If a man had been poisoned by strychnine, I should certainly expect to detect it. Cross-examined by the Attorney General Supposing that the whole dose were absorbed into the system, where would you expect to find it? In the blood. Does it pass from the blood into the solids of the body? It does, or, I should rather say, it is left in the solids of the body. In its progress towards its final destination, the destruction of life, it passes from the blood, or is left by the blood in the solid tissues of the body. If it be present in the stomach, you find it in the stomach. If it be present in the blood, you find it in the blood. If it be left by the blood in the tissues, you find it in the tissues? Precisely so. Suppose the whole had been absorbed, then I would not undertake to find it. Suppose the whole had been eliminated from the blood and had passed into the urine, should you expect to find any in the blood? Certainly not. Suppose that the minimum dose which will destroy life had been taken, and absorbed into the circulation, then deposited in the tissues, and then a part of it eliminated by the action of the kidneys, where should you search for it? In the blood, in the tissues, and in the ejections, and I would undertake to discover it in each of them. Re-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. Suppose you knew a man to have been killed by strychnia, administered to him one and a half hours before he died. In your judgment, would that strychnia certainly be detected in the stomach in the first instance? Yes. Suppose it to have been administered in the shape of pills, and completely absorbed and got out of the stomach, would it still be found? I can't tell. If it were found, it would be in the liver and kidneys. Could it be detected under those circumstances in the coats of the stomach? Not knowing the dose administered and the power of absorption, 
I cannot say that it would certainly be detected, but probably it could. When death has taken place after one paroxysm, and an hour and a half after ingestion of the poison, can you form an opinion as to whether the dose was considerable or inconsiderable? I cannot. Mr. Baron Alderson, how do you suppose strychnine acts when taken into the stomach? I cannot form an opinion. Mr. Baron Alderson, it goes, I suppose, from the stomach to the blood, and from the blood somewhere else, and arriving at that somewhere else, it kills. Lord Campbell, I cannot allow this witness to leave the box without expressing my high approbation of the manner in which he has given his evidence. Mr. Sergeant Shee requested to be allowed to ask the witness whether a strong dose was likely to pass through all the stages his lordship had mentioned. Mr. Baron Alderson, that depends on where the killing takes place. Professor Partridge, examined by Mr. Grove. I have been many years in extensive practice as a surgeon, and I am a professor of anatomy in King's College. I have heard the evidence as to Cook's symptoms and post-mortem examination. I have heard the statements as to the granules that were found on his spine. They would be likely to cause inflammation, and no doubt that inflammation would have been discovered if the spinal cord or its membranes had been examined shortly after death. It would not be likely to be discovered if the spinal cord was not examined until nine weeks after death. I have not seen cases in which this inflammation has produced tetanic form of convulsions, but such cases are on record. It sometimes does, and sometimes does not, produce convulsions and death. Can you form any judgment as to the cause of death in Cook's case? I cannot. No conclusion or inference can be drawn from the degree or kind of the contractions of the body after death. Lord Campbell. Can you not say, from the symptoms you heard, whether death was produced by tetanus, without saying that it was the cause of tetanus? Witness. Hypothetically, I should infer that he died of the form of tetanus which convulses the muscles. Great varieties of rigidity arise after death from natural causes. The half-bent hands and fingers are not uncommon after natural death. The arching of the feet, in this case, seemed to me rather greater than usual. Cross-examined by the Attorney-General. Granules are sometimes, but not commonly, found about the spine of a healthy subject. Not on the cord itself. They may exist consistently with health. No satisfactory cases of the inflammation I have described have come under my notice without producing convulsions. It is a very rare disease. I cannot state from the recorded cases the course of the symptoms of that disease. It varies in duration, sometimes lasting only for days, sometimes much longer. If the patient lives, it is accompanied with paralysis. It produces no effect upon the brain, which is recognizable after death. It would not affect the brain prior to death. I do not know whether it is attended with loss of sensibility before death. The size of the granules, which will produce it, varies. This disease is not a matter of months, unless it terminates in palsy. I never heard of a case in which the patient died after a single convulsion. Between the intervals of the convulsions, I don't believe a man could have twenty-four hours repose. Pain and spasms would accompany the convulsions. I cannot form a judgment as to whether the general health would be affected in the intervals between them. You have heard it stated that from the midnight of Monday till Tuesday, cook had complete repose now i ask you in the face of the medical profession whether you think the symptoms which have been described proceeded from that disease i should think not did you ever know the hands completely clinched after death except in case of tetanus no have you ever known it even in idiopathic or traumatic tetanus i have never seen idiopathic tetanus i have seen the hands completely clinched in traumatic tetanus a great deal of force is often required to separate them. Have you ever known the foot so distorted as to assume the form of a club foot? No. You heard Mr. Jones state that if he had turned the body upon the back it would have rested on the head and the heels. Have you any doubt that that is an indication of death from tetanus? No. 
it is a form of tetanic spasm i am only acquainted with tetanus resulting from strychnine by reading some of the symptoms in cook's case are consistent some are inconsistent with strychnine tetanus the first inconsistent symptom is the interval that occurred between the taking of the supposed poison and the attacks are not symptoms of bending of the body difficulty of respiration convulsions in the throat legs and arms perfectly consistent with what you know of the symptoms of death from strychnine perfectly consistent i have known cases of traumatic tetanus the symptoms in those cases have been occasionally remitted never wholly remitted i never knew traumatic tetanus run its course to death in less than three or four days i never knew a complete case of the operation of strychnine upon a human subject bearing in mind the distinction between traumatic and idiopathic tetanus did you ever know of such a death as that of cook according to the symptoms you have heard described no re-examined by mr grove besides the symptoms which i have mentioned as being inconsistent with the theory of death by strychnine there are others namely sickness beating the bedclothes want of sensitiveness to external impressions and sudden cessation of the convulsions and apparent complete recovery there was apparently an absence of the usual muscular agitation symptoms of convulsive character arising from an injury to the spine vary considerably in their degrees of violence in their periods of intermission and in the muscles which are attacked intermission of the disease occurs but is not frequent in traumatic tetanus i don't remember that death has ever taken place in fifteen hours it may take place in forty-eight hours during convulsions granules about the spine are more unusual in young people than in old i don't know of any case in which the spine can preserve its integrity so as to be properly examined for a period of nine weeks i should not feel justified in inferring that there was no disease from not finding any at the end of that time a period of decomposition varies from a few hours to a few days it is not in the least probable that it could be delayed for nine weeks by the attorney-general supposing the stomach were acted on by other causes i do not think sickness would be inconsistent with tetanus john gay examined by mr gray i am a fellow of the royal college of surgeons and i have been a surgeon to the royal free hospital a case of traumatic tetanus in a boy came under my observation in that hospital in eighteen forty three the patient was brought in during the time he was ill he was brought on the twenty eighth of july and died on the second of august he had met with an accident a week before during the first three days he had paroxysms of unusual severity his mother complained that he could not open his mouth and he complained of stiff neck during the night he started up and was convulsed on the following night he was again convulsed at times the abdominal muscles as well as those of the legs and back were rigid the muscles of the face were also in a state of great contraction on the following third day he was in the same state at two o'clock there was much less rigidity of the muscles especially those of the abdomen and back on the following morning the muscular rigidity had gone he opened his mouth and was able to talk he was thoroughly relieved he had no return of spasms till half past five the following day he then asked the nurse to change his linen and as she lifted him up in the bed to do so violent convulsions of the arms and face came on and he died in a few minutes about thirty hours elapsed between the preceding convulsion and the one which terminated his life before the paroxysm came on the rigidity had been completely relaxed i had given the patient tartar emetic containing antimony in order to produce vomiting on the second day it produced no effect i gave a larger dose on the third day which also produced no effect i gave no more after the third day cross-examined by the attorney-general the accident which had happened to him was that a large stone had fallen upon the middle toe of the left foot and completely smashed it the wound had become very unhealthy i amputated the toe the mouth was almost closed up when i first saw him 
The jaw remained closed until the 1st of August, but I could manage to get a small quantity of tartar emetic into the mouth. The convulsions were intermitted during the day, but the muscles of the body, chest, abdomen, back, and neck were all rigid, and continued so for the two days on which I administered tartar emetic. Rigidity of the muscles of the chest and stomach would, no doubt, go far to prevent vomiting. The symptoms began to abate on the morning of the 1st of August, the fourth day, and gradually subsided until the rigidity entirely wore off. I then thought he was going to get well. The wound might have been rubbed against the bed when he was raised, but I don't think it probable. Some peculiar irritation of the nerves would give rise to the affection of the spinal cord. No doubt the death took place in consequence of something produced by the injury to the toe. Re-examined by Mr. Gray. There may be various causes for that irritation of the spinal cord which ends in tetanic convulsions. It would be very difficult, merely from seeing symptoms of tetanus, and in the absence of all knowledge as to how it had been occasioned, to ascribe it to any particular cause. Dr. W. MacDonald, examined by Mr. Keneally. I am a licentiate of the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. I have been in practice for fourteen years, and have had considerable experience, practical and theoretical, of idiopathic and traumatic tetanus. I have seen two cases of idiopathic tetanus, and have made that disease the subject of medical research. Tetanus will proceed from very slight causes, an alteration of the secretions of the body, exposure to cold or damp, or mental excitement would cause it. Sensual excitement would produce it. The presence of gritty granules in the spine or brain might produce tetanic convulsions. I have seen cases in which small gritty tubercles in the brain were the only assignable cause of death which had resulted from convulsions. I believe that in addition to the slight causes which I have named, tetanic convulsions result from causes as yet undiscoverable by human science. In many post-mortem examinations of the body, of persons who had died from tetanus, no trace of any disease could be discovered beyond congestion or vascularity of some of the vessels surrounding the nerves. Strychnia, however, is very easily discoverable by a scientific man. I remember the case of a woman, Catherine Watson, who is now present, and who was attacked with idiopathic tetanus on the 20th of October, 1855. The witness read a report of the circumstances attending this case, the subject of which was a young woman, 22 years of age, who, after going about her ordinary occupation during the day, was attacked with tetanus at ten o'clock at night. By the administration of chloroform, the violence of the spasms was gradually diminished, and she recovered. After her recovery, she slept for thirty-six hours. In that case, there was lockjaw, which set in about the middle of the attack. It is generally a late symptom. I had a patient named Coupland, who died of tetanus. It must have been idiopathic, as there was no external cause. The patient died in somewhat less than half an hour, before I could reach the house. I have made a number of experiments upon animals with reference to strychnia poison. I have found the post-mortem appearances very generally to concur. The vessels of the membranes of the brain have generally been highly congested. The sinus is gorged with blood. In one case, there was hemorrhage from the nostrils. That was a case of very high congestion. In some cases, there have been an extraversation of blood at the base of the brain. I have cut through the substance of the brain and have found in it numerous red points. The lungs have been either collapsed or congested. The heart has invariably been filled with blood on the right side and very often on the left side too. The liver has been congested the kidneys and spleen generally healthy. The vessels of the stomach on the outer surface have been congested, and on the mucous or inner surface highly vascular. The vessels of the membranes of the spinal cord have been congested, and sometimes red points have been displayed on cutting it through. From a post-mortem examination you may generally judge of the cause of death. 
i have in a great many cases experimented for the discovery of strychnia you may discover in the stomach the smallest dose that will kill if you kill with a grain you may discover traces of it by traces i mean evidences of its presence you can discover the fifty thousandth part of a grain i have actually experimented so as to discover that quantity the decomposition of strychnia is a theory which no scientific man of eminence has ever before propounded i first heard of that theory in this court in my opinion there is no well-grounded reason whatever for it it has disproved the theory by numerous experiments i have taken the blood of an animal poisoned by two grains of strychnia about the least quantity which would destroy life and have injected it into the abdominal cavities of smaller animals and have destroyed them with all the symptoms and post-mortem appearances of poisoning by strychnia strychnia being administered in pills would not affect its detection if the pills were hard they would keep it together but you might find its remains more easily i do not agree with dr taylor that colour tests are fallacious i believe that such tests are a reliable mode of ascertaining the presence of strychnia i have invariably found strychnia in the urine which has been ejected strychnia cannot be confounded with pyrozanthi after strychnia has been administered there is an increased flow of saliva in my experiments that has been a very marked symptom animals to which strychnia has been given have always been very susceptible to touch the stamp of a foot or a sharp word would throw them into convulsions even before the paroxysms commenced touching them would be likely to throw them into tonic convulsions lord campbell as soon as the poison is swallowed no it would be after a certain time the first symptom of poisoning must have been developed examination continued i do not think rubbing them would give them relief i think it extremely improbable that a man who had taken a dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life could after the symptoms had made their appearance pull a bell violently i have attended to the evidence as to cook's symptoms to the symptoms i attach little importance as a means of diagnosis because you may have the same symptoms developed by many different causes a dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life would hardly require an hour and a half for its absorption i think that death was in this case caused by epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications i form that opinion from the post-mortem appearances being so different from those that i have described as attending poison with strychnia but from the supposition that a dose of strychnia sufficient to destroy life in one paroxysm could not so far as i am aware have required even an hour for its absorption before the commencement of the attack if the attack were of an epileptic character the interval between the attacks of monday and tuesday would be natural as epileptic seizures very often recur at about the same hours of successive days assuming that a man was in so excited a state of mind that he was silenced for two or three minutes after his horse had won a race that he exposed himself to cold and damp excited his brain by drink and was attacked by violent vomiting and that after his death deposits of gritty granules were found in the neighbourhood of the spinal cord would these causes be likely to produce such a death as that of cook any one of these causes would assist in the production of such a death as a congeries would they be still more likely to produce it yes cross-examined by the attorney-general i am a general practitioner and am parochial medical officer i have had personal experience of two cases of idiopathic tetanus what i have said about mental and sensual excitement and so on has not come within my own observation in the case of catherine watson i saw the patient at about half-past ten at night she had been ill nearly an hour and had five or six spasms she had gone about her usual duties up to evening she felt a slight lassitude for two days previous to the attack it was only by close pressing that i ascertained that lockjaw came on about an hour or two after i was called in the case of poopland was that of a young child between three and four years old i was attending the mother 
and saw the child in good health half an hour before it came on. It was seized with spasm, and what I conjectured to be of the diaphragm, and died in about half an hour. I had seen the child asleep, but I did not examine him. I don't know whether I saw the face of the child, but it was in bed. I judged that it was asleep. Is that the same as seeing it asleep? Sometimes a medical man can form a better judgment than a lawyer. Mr. Smith applied to me to be a witness in this case. I communicated to him the case of Catherine Watson as resembling the case of Cook. I furnished my notes to be copied the night before last. I have been here since the commencement of the trial. I have been at all the consultations. I began the experiments for this case in January. I have made experiments before. That was eight or ten years ago. I then found out that strychnia could be discovered by chemical and physiological tests. I killed dogs, cats, rabbits, and fowls. The doses I administered were from three quarters up to two grains. To dogs, the smallest quantity administered was a grain. In four cases, I killed with one grain, five with a grain and a half, one with a grain and a quarter, and two with two grains. I never killed a dog with half a grain of strychnia, and therefore never experimented to find that quantity after death. I have always found the brain and heart highly congested. The immediate course of the fullness of the heart is that the spasm drives the blood from the small capillaries into the large vessels. The spasm of the respiratory muscles prevents the expansion of the lungs. One lasted five or six days, the other six or seven days, and the patient recovered. I have never seen a case of strychnia in the human subject. So far as I can judge, Cook's was a case of epileptic convulsions, with tetanic complications. Nobody can say from what epilepsy proceeds. I have not arrived at any opinion on the subject. I have seen one death from epilepsy. The patient was not conscious when he died. I can't mention a case in which a patient dying from epilepsy has preserved his consciousness to the time of death. You have been reading up on the subject? I am pretty well up in most branches of medicine. A laugh. I know of no case in which a patient dying from epilepsy has been conscious. My opinion is Cook died of epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications. By Lord Campbell. That is a disease well known to physicians. It is mentioned in Dr. Copland's dictionary. Examination continued. I believe that all convulsive diseases, including the epileptic forms and the various tetanic complications, arise from the decomposition of the blood acting upon the nerves. Any mental excitement might have caused Cook's attack. Cook was excited at Shrewsbury, and wherever there is excitement, there is consequent depression. I think Cook was afterwards depressed. When a man is lying in bed and vomiting, he must be depressed. This gentleman was much overjoyed at his horse winning, and do you think he vomited in consequence? It might predispose him to vomit. I am not speaking of mites. Do you think that the excitement of the three minutes on the course at Shrewsbury on the Tuesday accounts for the vomiting on the Wednesday night? I do not. I find no symptoms of excitement or depression reported between that time and the time of his death. The white spots found in the stomach of the deceased might, by producing an inflammatory condition of the stomach, have brought on the convulsions which caused death. The Attorney General. But the gentlemen who made the post-mortem examination say that the stomach was not inflamed. Witness. There were white spots which cannot exist without inflammation. There must have been inflammation. The Attorney General. But these gentlemen say that there was not inflammation. Witness. I do not believe them. A laugh. Sensual excitement might cause epileptic convulsions with tetanic complications. The chancre and syphilitic sores were evidence that Cook had undergone such excitement. That might have occurred before he was at Shrewsbury. Might sexual intercourse produce epilepsy a fortnight after it occurred? There is an instance on record in which epilepsy supervened upon the very act of intercourse. 
have you any instance in which epilepsy came on a fortnight afterwards a laugh it is within the range of possibility do you mean as a serious man of science to say that the results might what results were there in this case the chancre and the syphilitic sores did you ever dream of such a thing i never heard of it did you ever hear of any other form of syphilitic disease producing epilepsy no but tetanus the attorney-general but you say this was epilepsy we are not talking of tetanus witness you forget the tetanic complications roars of laughter the attorney-general if i understand right then it stands thus the sexual excitement produces epilepsy and the chancre superad tetanic complications witness i say that the results of sexual excitement produce epilepsy mr baron alderson said he had heard some person in court clap his hands on an occasion on which a man is being tried for his life such a display was most indecent examination continued i cannot remember any fatal case of poisoning by strychnia in which so long a period as an hour and a half intervened between the taking of the poison and the appearance of the first symptoms what would be the effect of morphia given a day or two previously would it not retard the action of the poison no i have seen opium bring on convulsions very nearly similar what quantity a grain and a half from my experience i think that if morphia had been given a day or two before it would have accelerated the action of the strychnia i have seen opium bring on epileptic convulsions if this were a case of poisoning by strychnia i should suppose that as both opium and strychnia produce congestion of the brain the two would act together and would have a more speedy effect if congestion of the brain was coming on when morphia was given to cook on the sunday and monday nights it might have increased rather than allayed it but the gentlemen who examined the body say that there was no congestion after death but dr bamford says there was you stick to dr bamford yes i do because he was a man of experience could judge much better than younger men and he was not so likely to be mistaken but dr bamford said that cook died of apoplexy do you think this was apoplexy no it was not what then do you think of dr bamford who certified that it was that was a matter of opinion but the existence of congestion in the brain he saw the attorney-general the other medical men said there was none lord campbell that is rather a matter of reasoning than of evidence re-examined by mr sergeant shee i have seen a great many children asleep and can tell whether they are so without seeing their faces in the case of the child who died of tetanus the mother had told me that it was asleep dr mason good is a well-known author upon convulsions from my reading of his work and others i have learned that there are convulsions which are not strictly speaking epilepsy although they resemble it in some of its features i also know the works of m esquirol from reading those and other works i know that epileptic convulsions sufficiently violent to cause death frequently occur without the patient entirely losing his consciousness epilepsy properly so called is sudden in its attack the patient falls down at once with the shriek that disease occurs very often at night and in bed it sometimes happens that during such convulsions actual epilepsy comes on and the patient dies of an internal spasm it sometimes happens that its existence is known to a young man's family without his knowing anything about it convulsions of an epileptic character are sometimes preceded by premonitory symptoms it sometimes happens that during such convulsions actual epilepsy comes on and the patient dies of an internal spasm it often happens that if a patient has suffered from epilepsy and convulsions of an epileptic kind during the night he may as well be next day as if nothing had happened more especially when an adult is seized for the first time in such cases it often happens that such fits succeed each other within a short period i heard the deposition of dr bamford 
if it were true that the mind of the deceased were distressed and irritable the night before his death i should say that he was suffering from depression from what cook said about his madness in the middle of the sunday night i should infer that he had been seized by some sudden cramp or spasm supposing that there was no such cramp i should refer what he said to nervous and mental excitement there might be some disturbance of the brain i do not believe that inflammation can be absent while spots on the stomach be present about eighteen months ago i examined the stomach of a person who had died from fever in which i found white spots i consulted various authors in an essay on the stomach by dr sprodboyne a medical man who practised in edinburgh i found mention of similar spots in the stomach of a young woman who had died suddenly dr bainbridge examined by mr grove i am a doctor of medicine and medical officer to the st martin's workhouse i have had much experience of convulsive disorders such disorders present great variety of symptoms they vary as to the frequency of the occurrence and as to the muscles affected periodicity or recurrence at the same hours days or months is common i had a case in which a patient had an attack on one christmas night and on the following christmas night at the same hour he had a similar attack the various forms of convulsions so run into each other that it is almost impossible for the most experienced medical men to state where one terminates and the other begins in both males and females hysteria is frequently attended by tetanic convulsions epileptic attacks are frequently accompanied by tetanic complications cross-examined by the attorney-general hysteric convulsions very rarely end in death i have known one case in which they have done so that occurred within the last three months it was the case of a male it occurred in st martin's workhouse the man had for years been subject to this complaint on the occasion on which he died he was ill only a few minutes i did not make a post-mortem examination i was told he was seized with sudden convulsions fell down on the ground and in five minutes was dead there was slight clinching of the hands but i think no locking of the jaw the man was about thirty-five years of age he was the brother of the celebrated aeronaut lieutenant gale in many cases of this description consciousness is destroyed it is not so in all i have met with violent cases in which it has been preserved i never knew a case in which during the paroxysm the patient spoke epilepsy is sometimes attended with opisthotonus i have seen cases of traumatic tetanus in such cases the patient retains his consciousness i have known many cases of epilepsy ending in death loss of consciousness not universally but generally accompanies epilepsy i never knew a case of death from that disease where consciousness was not destroyed i have known ten or twelve such fatal cases re-examined by mr grove persons almost invariably fall asleep after an epileptic attack the attorney-general and after taking opium yes edward austin steady examined by mr gray i am a member of the royal college of surgeons and am in practice at chatham in june eighteen fifty four i attended a person named sarah ann taylor for trismus and pleurotothonus when i first saw the patient she was bent to one side the convulsions came on in paroxysms the pleurotothonus and trismus lasted about a fortnight the patient then so far recovered as to be able to walk about about a twelvemonth afterwards on the third of march eighteen fifty five she was again seized that seizure lasted about a week she is still alive the friends of the patient said that the disease was brought on by depression arising from a quarrel with her husband cross-examined by mr james i do not know how long before the attack this quarrel occurred during it the woman received a blow on her side from her husband during the whole fortnight the lockjaw or trismus continued in march eighteen fifty five she was under my care about a week during the whole of which the trismus continued dr george robinson examined by mr keneally 
i am a licentiate of the royal college of physicians and physician to the newcastle on tyne dispensary and fever hospital i have devoted considerable attention to the subject of pathology i have practised as a physician for ten years i have heard the whole of the medical evidence in this case from the symptoms described i should say that cook died of tetanic convulsions by which i mean not the convulsions of tetanus but convulsions similar to those witnessed in that disease the convulsions of epilepsy sometimes assume a tetanic appearance i know no department of pathology more obscure than that of convulsive diseases i have witnessed post-mortem examinations after death from convulsive diseases and have sometimes seen no morbid appearance whatever and in other cases the symptoms were applicable to a great variety of diseases convulsive diseases are always connected with the condition of the nerves the brain has a good deal to do with the production of convulsive diseases but the spinal cord has more i believe that gritty granules in the region of the spinal cord would be very likely to produce convulsions and i think they would be likely to be very similar to those described in the present case i think that from what i have heard described of the mode of life of the deceased it would have predisposed him to epilepsy i have witnessed some experiments with strychnia and have performed a few i have also prescribed it in cases of paralysis by the attorney-general i have seen twenty cases where epilepsy has been attended by convulsions of a tetanic character i have never seen the symptoms of epilepsy proceed to anything like the extent of the symptoms in cook's case i never saw a body in a case of epilepsy so stiff as to rest upon the head and the heels i never knew such symptoms to arise in any case except tetanus when epilepsy presents any of these extreme forms it is always accompanied by unconsciousness in almost every case of epilepsy the patient is unconscious at the time of the attack in cases of epilepsy i have found gritty granules on the brain and any disturbing cause in the system i think would be likely to produce convulsions i believe that the granules in this case were very likely to have irritated the spinal cord and yet that no indication of that irritation would have remained after death i think that these granules might have produced the death of mr cook the attorney-general do you think that they did so witness putting aside the assumption of death by strychnia i should say so the attorney-general are not all the symptoms spoken to by mr jones indicative of death by strychnia witness they certainly are the attorney-general then it comes to this that if there were no other cause of death suggested you would say that the death in this case arose from epilepsy witness yes by sergeant she epilepsy is a well-known form of disease which includes many others dr richardson said i am a physician practising in london i have never seen a case of tetanus properly so called but i have seen many cases of death by convulsions in many instances they have presented tetanic appearances without being strictly tetanus i have seen the muscles fixed especially those of the upper part of the body i have observed the arms stiffened out and the hands closely and firmly clinched until death i have also observed a sense of suffocation in the patient in some forms of convulsions i have seen contortions both of the legs and the feet and the patient generally expresses a wish to sit up i have known persons die of a disease called angina pectoris the symptoms of that disease i consider resemble closely those of mr cook angina pectoris comes under the denomination of spasmodic diseases in some cases the disease is detectable upon post-mortem examination in others it is not i attended one case a girl ten years old was under my care in eighteen fifty i supposed she had suffered from scarlet fever she recovered so far that my visits ceased i left her amused and merry in the morning at half past ten in the evening i was called in to see her and i found her dying she was supported upright at her own request her face was pale the muscles of the face rigid the arms rigid the fingers clinched 
the respiratory muscles completely fixed and rigid and with all this there was combined intense agony and restlessness such as i have never witnessed there was perfect consciousness the child knew me described her agony and eagerly took some brandy and water from the spoon i left for the purpose of obtaining some chloroform from my own house which was thirty yards distant when i returned her head was drawn back and i could detect no respiration the eyes were then fixed open and the body just resembled a statue she was dead on the following day i made a post-mortem examination the brain was slightly congested the upper part of the spinal cord seemed healthy the lungs were collapsed the heart was in such a state of firm spasm and solidity and so emptied of blood that i remarked that it might have been rinsed out i could not discover any appearance of disease that would account for the death except a slight effusion of serum in one pleural cavity i never could ascertain any cause for the death the child went to bed well and merry and immediately afterwards jumped up screamed and exclaimed i am going to die by the attorney-general i consider that the symptoms i have described were those of angina pectoris it is the opinion of dr jenner that this disease is occasioned by the ossification of some of the small vessels of the heart i did not find that to be the case in this instance there have been many cases where no cause whatever was discovered it is called angina pectoris from its causing such extreme anguish to the chest i do not think the symptoms i have described were such as would result from taking strychnia there is this difference that rubbing the hands gives ease to the patient in cases of angina pectoris i must say there will be great difficulty in detecting the difference in the cases of angina pectoris and strychnia as regards symptoms i know of no difference between the two i am bound to say that if i had known so much of these subjects as i do now in the case i have referred to i should have gone on to analysis to endeavour to detect strychnia in the second case i discovered organic disease of the heart which was quite sufficient to account for the symptoms the disease of angina pectoris comes on quite suddenly and does not give any notice of its approach i did not send any note of this case to any medical publication it is not at all an uncommon occurrence to find the hands firmly clinched after death in cases of natural disease by mr sergeant she there are cases of angina pectoris in which the patient has recovered and appeared perfectly well for a period of twenty-four hours and then the attack has returned i am of opinion that the fact of the recurrence of the second fit in cook's case is more the symptom of angina pectoris than of strychnia poison dr wrightson was recalled and in answer to a question put by sergeant she he said it was his opinion that when the strychnia poison was absorbed in the system it was diffused throughout the entire system by the attorney-general the longer time that elapsed before the death would render the absorption more complete if a minimum dose to destroy life were given and a long interval elapsed to the death the more complete would be the absorption and the less the chance of finding it in the stomach by sergeant she i should expect still to find it in the spleen the liver and blood Catherine watson said i live in garnkirk near glasgow i was attacked with a fit in october of last year i had no wound of any kind on my body when i was attacked i did not take any poison by the attorney-general i was taken ill at night i had felt heavy all day from the morning but had no pain till night the first pain i felt was in my stomach and then i had cramp in my arms and after that i was quite insensible I have no recollection of anything after I was first attacked, except that I was bled. Sergeant She then said that he was now about to enter into another part of the case for the defence, and, probably, the court would think it a convenient period to adjourn. The Lord Chief Justice said that the court had no objection to adjourn if the learned sergeant thought it would be a convenient time to do so. The Attorney-General requested that before the court was formally adjourned, a witness named saunders whose name was upon the back of the bill and who was not in attendance and who he believed had not made his appearance during the trial should be called upon his recognizances 
he added that he believed this witness was also subpoenaed on behalf of the prisoner but he the attorney-general intended to have called him for the crown the court directed that the witness should be called upon his recognizances and this was done but he did not appear the court then adjourned until ten o'clock on saturday morning End of section 18. Section 19 of the Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Tenth day, May the 24th. The Lord Chief Justice Campbell, Mr. Baron Alderson, and Mr. Justice Cresswell took their seats at ten o'clock. The interest felt in this extraordinary trial was by no means diminished, notwithstanding the tedious length to which the proceedings have extended. The interior of the court was crowded in every part, crowds were collected outside, and numbers of persons who had considered themselves fortunate in obtaining orders of admission from the sheriff were ranged in long rows along the passages leading to the court, anxiously awaiting the only chance of admission which was afforded them by some more fortunate brother spectator vacating his position. The counsel for the Crown were, as on previous days, the Attorney General, Mr. James Q.C., Mr. Bodkin Q.C., Mr. Wellsby, and Mr. Huddleston. Counsel for the prisoner, Mr. Sergeant Shee, Mr. Grove Q.C., Mr. Gray, and Mr. Keneally close of the medical evidence the names of the jurors having been called over mr oliver pemberton lecturer on anatomy of queen's college birmingham and surgeon to the general hospital of that town was sworn and examined by mr grove q c witness said i was present at the examination of the body of cook after its exhumation in january and closely examined the condition of the spinal cord it was not however in such a condition as to enable me to say confidently in what state it was immediately after death the upper part where the brain had been separated was green in colour from the effects of decomposition the remaining portion though fairly preserved for the body had been buried two months was so soft as to prevent my drawing any opinion of its state immediately after death cross-examined by the attorney-general I saw the body on the day after the bony canal had been opened. The opening of that canal would, to a certain extent, expose the cord, but the outer covering, or dura mater, was not opened, to the best of my recollection, until I arrived. I attended the examination on the part of the prisoner. Mr. Bolton, Professor of Queen's College, Birmingham, was also present on the occasion on the part of Palmer. By Mr. Sergeant Shee was there any difference of opinion expressed on that occasion by the medical men the attorney-general objected to the question lord campbell decided that it could not be put mr sergeant shee said that this witness brought to a conclusion the medical evidence on the part of palmer general evidence henry matthews examined by mr grove i am inspector of police at the euston square railway station I was stationed there on Monday, 19th November last. At two o'clock in the afternoon of that day, a train left London which would stop at Rugeley. No train after that hour stops at Rugeley. The express train left at five in the afternoon. It is due at Stafford at 8.42 p.m. It did not arrive till 8.45. The distance from Stafford to Rugeley by railway is nine miles. I do not know the distance by road. The shortest and quickest mode of getting to Rugeley after the two o'clock train would be by the five o'clock express to Stafford, and thence by road to Rugeley. Joseph Foster, examined by Mr. Gray. I am a farmer and grazier at Sibbertoft in Northamptonshire. I kept the George Hotel at Welford in that county up to Lady Day last i knew the late john parsons cook for many years previous to his death i have met him at various places in the hunting field at dinners and elsewhere i have had opportunities of judging his health 
i think he was of a very weak constitution i form that judgment from having been with him on several occasions when he suffered from bilious attacks those are the only circumstances upon which i formed that opinion cross-examined by mr james i knew mr cook for ten years he hunted regularly for the last two years in nottinghamshire he kept sometimes two and sometimes three horses i have known him to hunt three days a week when he was well i knew mr george pell there was a cricket club at welford i do not know whether cook was a member of the club i have seen him there i saw cook for the last time at lutterworth about the middle of october last i last knew him to have a bilious sick headache about a year and a half ago laughter lord chief justice campbell i most strongly implore that there will be no expression of any sensation evinced at the answers given by any of the witnesses by mr james i saw cook at my own house when he complained of suffering he did not hunt on that day he came to my house to meet the hounds but did not go he was dressed in his hunting dress i could not swear but i did not see him next within a week afterwards in the hunting field by lord campbell i never saw cook sick on any other occasion except about seven years previous at market harborough at the cricket match after dinner george myatt saddler examined by mr gray i was at shrewsbury races on the day when polestar won i was at the raven hotel on the evening of that day wednesday i saw cook and palmer there about twelve o'clock on the night of that day i was waiting in the room at the hotel when they came in i considered cook was the worst for liquor they proposed having a glass of brandy and water each before they went to bed each of us had a glass of brandy and water when cook commenced to drink he made a remark that he fancied it was not good he drank part of it off and said he thought there was something in it he then gave it to someone near him to taste cook proposed to have some more and palmer said he would not have any more except cook drank his up they had no more brandy and water and palmer and i went to bed i slept in the same room with palmer the brandy was brought in a decanter and the brandy which i had was poured out of the decanter i don't know by whom i did not leave the room during the time when palmer and cook came in to me until we went to bed i did not see anything put into the brandy and water and i do not think anything could have been put in without my seeing it palmer and i went into the bedroom and left cook in the sitting-room i slept in the same bedroom as palmer when i went to bed i locked the door and palmer did not go out of the room during the night when palmer got up in the morning he asked me to go and call cook i did so i went to cook's bedroom door rapped at it and he told me to come in i went in and he told me how ill he had been during the night and that he had been obliged to send for a doctor he asked me what it was that was put into the brandy and water and i told him i did not know that anything had been put into it he asked me to send for the doctor meaning palmer i did so i next saw cook when he came in to his breakfast palmer was in the room palmer and i breakfasted first and cook came in directly after we had finished and had breakfast in the same room on the evening of that day cook palmer and myself left for rugeley having previously dined together at the raven we started for rugeley about six o'clock in the evening we travelled by the express train from shrewsbury palmer paid for the three railway tickets on the way palmer was sick and both cook and he said they could not account for the circumstance of their being sick palmer vomited on the road between stafford and rugeley we left the train at stafford at the junction and then we got into a fly and proceeded to rugeley there being no train for that place it was on the way to rugeley that palmer was ill and vomited palmer said he could not account for it unless it was that cook had some brass vessel which he had drunk out of or that the water was bad there had been a great many people ill during the shrewsbury races i heard several people speak of their having been ill who could not account for it the distance by road from stafford to rugeley is about nine miles cross-examined by mr james i have known palmer all my life he deals with me for saddlery i have not been in the habit of going to the races with him but i have gone now and then 
I was at Shrewsbury Races with him. I never was at Doncaster with him. I was there once with a gentleman named Robinson. I was at Wolverhampton Races in August last. I went with Palmer. I did not sleep in the same room with him at Wolverhampton. I did not stop in the same hotel with him. I stopped with my brother-in-law in Wolverhampton. I believe I was there a couple of days. I did not dine or breakfast with Palmer. I was at Litchfield Races with Palmer in September. Litchfield Course is within ten miles of Rugeley. I did not sleep at Litchfield. I did not either go to Litchfield or come home with Palmer. I believe I have never slept in a double-bedded room with Palmer anywhere but at Shrewsbury. I never did. I never was at Worcester in my life. I paid my own expenses to Shrewsbury. Palmer paid the expenses of my living at the hotel at Shrewsbury and the fare back. He has never paid my expenses at any other races. If he has paid any expenses for me, I have deducted them from his bill. I dare say I went to some races with him the year before, I think two or three, but I can't call to mind how many. I had an interview with Palmer in Stafford Jail. I was with him a couple of hours. I should think that that was a month or five weeks ago. I cannot say when it was that I saw him. I cannot say whether it was before or after Stafford Assizes. Mr. Smith said he was going, and I thought I should like to see Palmer. I have stood half a sovereign or a sovereign with him occasionally. I know what putting on a horse means. I did not bet at Shrewsbury. I did not back Cook's mare, Polestar. I have stood a sovereign with Palmer on a horse. The first time when I saw Cook at the Raven on the Wednesday evening was as near twelve o'clock as possible. I had not been dining with Palmer. I had dined at home at Rugeley. I arrived at Shrewsbury about eight o'clock. I went to the Raven. I knew the room which Palmer generally had, and I went up to see if he was there. That was between eight and nine o'clock. I went there direct from the railway station. I saw Cook at the door outside. He asked me what brought me there. I told him I was come to see how they were getting on. I found that Palmer had gone out, and I then went into the town. I was away about an hour, and then returned to the Raven. I went into Palmer's sitting-room. Palmer was not there. I waited in the sitting-room till he came. There was a man named Shelley there. He was a betting man. I waited about a couple of hours before Palmer came in. I think he came in about twelve o'clock, but I can't say exactly. He came in with Cook. I saw that Cook was the worse for liquor. He was not very drunk, but I could see that he was the worse for liquor. The brandy and water was brought in directly. The brandy was in a decanter. I believe the water was on the table, but I cannot say. I should say the brandy and the tumbler were brought up together. I don't remember Mrs. Brooks coming. I don't remember Palmer being called out of the room. I remember a gentleman coming in. I know now that he was Mr. Fisher. Before Fisher came in, Palmer had not left the room. That I will swear. Palmer never left the room until he went to bed. I swear that positively. I was close to him the whole time. When Fisher came in, Cook asked Palmer to have some more brandy and water. Palmer said he would not have any more unless Cook drank his. It was evident to any one that Cook was the worse for liquor. Cook said, I'll drink mine, and he drank it as a draught. Directly after he drank it, he said, there's something in it. He did not say, it burns my throat dreadfully. He said that the brandy was not good. I will swear he did not say, it burns my throat dreadfully, or anything of that kind. He gave it to someone to taste. I believe it was Fisher, but will not swear. I can't say whether it was Palmer or Cook who gave it to Fisher to taste. I believe there were only four persons in the room at that time. I can't say whether any other person came into the room before we went to bed. Cook had emptied the glass as nearly as possible. There was a little left in it. I can't swear whether Palmer touched the glass or not. I believe he did taste. I believe Palmer said he could not taste anything that was the matter with the brandy and water, and he gave it to Fisher. I don't recollect Fisher saying, It's no good giving me the glass, it is empty. I can't swear whether he said so or not. I should think we remained in the room twenty minutes after that. Cook did not leave the room before we went to bed. Palmer and I went straight up to bed. We left Cook in the sitting-room. 
i did not hear that night that cook had been vomiting and was ill i took one glass of brandy and water we had one glass each the water was cold on the following day i dined with palmer at the raven mr cook served me with what i had to eat during the first two days of the inquest i was at home at rugeley i did not go to the inquest re-examined by mr grove i was not subpoenaed for the crown i was examined but not summoned the deputy governor was not present all the time i was with palmer at stafford he went out once but another officer came in palmer did not say a word about this case there was an officer present the whole time the attorney general i wish to ask the witness whether he did not tell mr gardiner when he was asked about the brandy and water that he knew nothing about it the lord chief justice there is no objection to that question witness i never spoke to him about brandy and water at all the attorney general did you meet him at Hedensford, where saunders lives yes the attorney general did you not tell him that you could recollect nothing about brandy and water no the attorney general had you no conversation at all i had with mr stevens the attorney general did you not say in mr gardiner's presence that you could recollect nothing about the brandy and water i did not the attorney general were you not examined by mr crisp and mr sweeting before the inquest was held and did you not tell them that you knew nothing about the brandy and water no i did not the attorney general you swear you did not tell them anything about it yes john sergeant examined by mr sergeant she i am not in any business or profession i am in the habit of attending almost all public races in the kingdom i knew the late mr cook intimately and also the prisoner palmer i received a letter from cook during the shrewsbury races i was subpoenaed on the part of the crown i have not had any notice to produce that letter i have not got it i have searched for it but i had sent it to saunders the trainer i have made application to saunders for it the application was by letter i received a letter in answer i have seen saunders since i have done everything i could to get cook's letter i have not a copy of it but i know what its contents were the court decided that the contents of the letter could not be received at that moment as saunders perhaps might attend before the conclusion of the day examination continued i was not at shrewsbury and only know what cook stated in his letter shortly before cook's death i had an opportunity of noticing the state of his throat i was with him at liverpool the week previous to the shrewsbury meeting we slept in adjoining rooms in the morning he called my attention to the state of his throat the back part of the throat was a complete ulcer and the throat was very much inflamed his tongue was swollen i said i was surprised on seeing the state of his mouth that he could eat anything he said he had been in that state for weeks and months and now he did not take notice of it that was all that passed respecting the sore throat on that occasion he had shown his throat to me previously at almost every meeting we attended on the platform at liverpool after the races he took a gingerbread cayenne nut by mistake i saw him take it he did not know it was a cayenne nut he told me afterwards that it nearly killed him he did not state more particularly then the effect which it had produced on him i know that cook was very poor at the liverpool meeting that was the week before the shrewsbury races he owed me twenty five pounds and gave me ten pounds on account and said he had not sufficient to pay his expenses at liverpool but that i should have the balance of twenty five pounds at the shrewsbury meeting cook and palmer were in the habit of putting on horses for each other they did so at the liverpool meeting i put money on at liverpool for palmer and palmer told me that cook stood it along with him i heard cook a short time before his death apply to palmer to supply him with black wash i don't know whether it is a mercurial lotion i never saw cook's throat dressed by anybody cross-examined by mr james the black wash was not to be drunk a laugh the application was made to palmer at the warwick spring meeting in eighteen fifty five cook was at newmarket i lived in the same house with him there he was at nearly all the race meetings last year 
His appetite was very good, and that surprised me. The cayenne nut is made up for a trick and mixed with other gingerbread nuts. Cook got one of those. I have tasted them. Some of them are stronger than others. Jeremiah Smith by Mr. Sergeant Shee I am an attorney at Rugeley. I am acquainted with the prisoner and was acquainted with Cook. I saw Cook at the Talbot Arms on Friday the 16th of November. He was in his bedroom. I saw him about ten o'clock. I was present at his breakfast. A small tray was put on the bed. He took tea for breakfast and had a wine glass of brandy in it. I dined with him at Palmer's house. I am not quite positive that I had seen him between breakfast and dinner. We had a rump steak for dinner. We had some champagne at dinner. We drank port wine after dinner. He had three bottles altogether, and Cook took his share. Cook, myself, and Palmer dined together. We left the house about six in the evening. Cook and I left the house together. We went to my house and afterwards to the Albion Hotel, which is next door. We had a glass of cold brandy and water. Cook left me there. He said he felt cold and warmed himself at the fire. He said he had borrowed a book and would go home and read it in bed. That was between seven and eight o'clock, but I can't say exactly. In the afternoon, after dinner, we were talking about racing. I asked Cook for money, for fifty pounds. He gave me five pounds. When he was taking the note out of his pocket case, I said, Mr. Cook, you can pay me all. He said, No, there is only forty-one pounds ten shillings due to you. He said that he had given Palmer money, and would pay me the remainder when he returned from Tattersall's on the Monday. On the night following, Saturday night, he was not well, and I slept in his room. It was late when I went, I should think about eleven or twelve o'clock. I had been at a concert during the early part of the night on which Cook was unwell. He had got some toast and water and was washing his mouth. He was sick. There was a night chair in the room before the fire. I saw him sitting there. He tried to vomit, but whether he did so or not I cannot say, for I did not get out of bed. I went to sleep about two o'clock. I slept until Palmer and Bamford came into the room in the morning. I lay still in bed and heard a conversation between the doctor and Cook. Bamford said, Well, Mr. Cook, how are you this morning? Cook said, I am rather better this morning. I slept from about two or three o'clock after the house had become quiet. Bamford said, I'll send you some medicine. I don't recollect any further conversation. I know Mrs. Palmer, prisoner's mother. She sent a message to me on Monday, and I went to her and saw her. In consequence of what had passed, I went to look for the prisoner to see if he had arrived. That was about nine o'clock. I saw Palmer at ten minutes past ten. He came from the direction of Stafford in a car. He said to me, Have you seen Cook today? I said, No, I have been to Litchfield on business. On which Palmer said, He had better go and see how he was before he went to his mother's. Palmer and I went to Cook's room together. Cook said, You are late, doctor, tonight. I did not expect you to look in. I have taken the medicine which you gave me. We did not stay more than two or three minutes, and I think Cook asked me why I did not call earlier, and I said I had been detained on business. Cook said Bamford had sent him some pills which he had taken, and he intimated that he would not have taken them if Palmer had come earlier. Cook told Palmer that he had been up talking with Saunders, and Palmer said, You ought not to have done so. Palmer and I left the room together, and we went straight to his mother's. The distance of Mr. Palmer's house from the Talbot Arms is about four or five hundred yards. We were there about half an hour. We both left together and went to Palmer's house. I entered with him. I asked him to let me have a glass of grog, but did not get it. I then went home. After dining with Palmer on Friday, I invited Cook and Palmer to dine with me on the next day, Saturday. Cook sent a message stating that he was not well and could not leave his room. I ordered a boiled leg of mutton for dinner and sent part of the broth from the Albion by the charwoman. I think her name was Rowley. Previous to Cook's death, I borrowed two hundred pounds for Cook and negotiated a loan with Pratt for him for five hundred pounds. The two hundred pound transaction was in May. I borrowed one hundred pounds of Mrs. Palmer and one hundred pounds of William Palmer making together the two hundred pounds to which I have referred. 
i knew that palmer and cook were jointly interested in one horse and that they were in the habit of betting for each other when cook's horse was going to run palmer put on for him and when palmer's ran cook put on for him i have seen thirlby palmer's assistant dress cook's throat with caustic i think this was before the races at shrewsbury i have some signatures of cook's which i known to be in his handwriting the two notes with instructions to negotiate the loan of five hundred pounds i saw cook sign the notes were put in one of them is signed j p cook the other j parsons cook i knew from cook that he was served with a writ i do not remember that i received any instruction to appear for him the letters put in were read by mr straight the clerk of arraigns the first was without date and signed j parsons cook monday the following is a copy of the letter quote, my dear sir i have been in a devil of a fix about the bill but have at last settled it at the cost of an extra two guineas for the blank discounter had issued a writ against me i am very much disgusted at it End quote. the letter was sent to me but its envelope was destroyed the next letter bore the date twenty fifth of june eighteen fifty five it was also without address but witness stated that it had been sent to him and he had destroyed the envelope the following is a copy of the letter Quote, dear jerry i should like to have the bill renewed for two months can it be done let me know by return i have scratched polestar for the nottinghamshire and wolverhampton states i shall be down on saturday fred tells me arabis will win the northumberland stakes End quote. the memorandum put in and read was signed j p cook and the following is a copy quote, polestar three years serious two years by way of mortgage to secure two hundred pounds advanced upon a bill of exchange for two hundred pounds dated twenty ninth of august eighteen fifty five payable about three months after date cross-examined by the attorney-general i am the person who took mr myatt to stafford jail i have known palmer long and intimately and have been employed a good deal as attorney for him and his family i cannot recollect that he applied to me in december eighteen fifty four to attest a proposal for insurance on the life of walter palmer for thirteen thousand pounds in the solicitors and general's assurance office i will not swear that i was not applied to on the subject i do not recollect that an application was made to me to attest a proposal for thirteen thousand pounds on the prince of wales on walter palmer's life in january eighteen fifty five i know that walter palmer had been a bankrupt but not that he was an uncertificated bankrupt his bankruptcy took place at least six years ago he had been in no business since that period to the time of his death i knew that walter had an allowance from his mother and he had also money at various times from his brother william in the years eighteen fifty four and eighteen fifty five i lived at rugeley sometimes at palmer's house and sometimes at his mother's there was no improper intimacy between myself and palmer's mother i slept at her house frequently perhaps two or three times a week having my own place of abode at rugeley how long did this habit continue of sleeping two or three times a week at mrs palmer's house several years had you your own lodgings and chambers at rugeley yes your own bedroom yes how far were your lodgings from mrs palmer's house nearly a quarter of a mile will you be so good as to explain why having your own place of abode and your own bedroom so near to mrs palmer's you were still in the habit of sleeping two or three times a week for several years at the house of mrs palmer yes sometimes there were members of mrs palmer's family present who were they there was mr joseph palmer who resides at liverpool mr walter palmer too and sometimes william palmer when you went to see the members of palmer's family was it too late when you separated to return to your own lodgings we used to stop very late drinking gin and water smoking and sometimes afterwards playing at cards then you did not go to your own lodgings no and this continued several years two or three times a week yes did you ever stay at mrs palmer's house all night when there were no members of the family visiting yes frequently 
how often as many as two or three times a week when there were none of mrs palmer's sons there yes and when the mother was yes how often did that happen i cannot say sometimes two or three times a week when there was no one else in the house but the lady there was the mother daughter and servants you might have gone to your own home then for there was no one to drink brandy and water with or to smoke with i might have done so but i did not do you mean then to swear solemnly that no improper intimacy subsisted between you and palmer's mother i do sensation now i will turn to another subject do you remember being applied to by palmer to attest a proposal for the insurance of ten thousand pounds on the life of walter palmer in the universal life office i do not remember if you have any document which will show it i shall be able to recollect perhaps now do you remember getting a five pound note for attesting the signature of walter palmer's assignment of his policy to his brother i do not is that your signature handing a document to witness it is very similar to it is it not yours i do not know sensation upon your oath sir is not that your signature witness hesitating examine the document and then tell me on your oath whether that is not your signature witness examined the document now you have perused it tell me is not that your signature witness hesitating i have some doubts whether this is my handwriting sensation have you read the whole of the document i have not then do so witness again perused the whole of the paper now was that document prepared in your office it was not have you ever seen it before it is very much like my handwriting that is not what i asked you upon your oath have you ever seen that document before witness with hesitation it is very much like my handwriting sensation i will have an answer to my question upon your oath sir is not that your handwriting i think it is not my handwriting i think it is a very clever imitation of it sensation will you swear it is not your handwriting i will swear it is not my handwriting renewed sensation the attorney general will your lordship please to take a note of that answer mr baron alderson did you ever make such an attestation as that in your hand i do not remember the attorney general now is that the signature of walter palmer handing a paper to witness i believe it to be is that the signature of pratt i do not know did you not receive that paper from pratt i believe i did not i think william palmer gave it me well did he give it you i don't recollect i repeat my question did william palmer give you that document most likely he did did he i ask again it was not signed at the time but did he give it you i will have an answer i have no doubt he did well then if that document bears the signature of walter palmer and was given to you by william palmer cannot you tell whether it bears your own signature or not mr attorney don't mr attorney me answer my question upon your oath is not that your handwriting i believe it not to be will you swear it is not i believe it is not great sensation now did you apply to the midland counties insurance office to be appointed agent to the company at rugeley i did when was this i should like to fetch my documents and papers i should then be able to answer you accurately oh never mind the papers was it in october eighteen fifty five i think it was did you send up a proposal for the insurance of ten thousand pounds on the life of bates i did did william palmer ask you to make that proposal bates and palmer came together to my office with a prospectus and asked me if i knew whether there was an agent for the midland county's office in rugeley i told him i never heard of one 
he asked me afterwards if i would write to get the appointment because bates wanted to raise some money did you send to the midland county's office to get the appointment of agent in order that you might be enabled to effect this insurance on bates's life i did did you make the application in order to get the insurance effected i did upon the life of bates for ten thousand pounds i did sensation bates was at that time superintending william palmer's stud and stables i do not know at what salary i afterwards went to the widow of walter palmer to get her to give up her claim on the policy of her husband she was then at liverpool william palmer gave me a letter for pratt to take to her to sign mrs palmer said she would like to see her solicitor about it i brought the document back with me because she did not sign it i had no instructions to leave it did she give any reason for not signing it mr sergeant she objected to the question lord campbell decided that it could not be put the attorney-general do you know whether walter palmer received anything on executing the assignment of his policy to william palmer i believe he ultimately had something did he not get a bill for two hundred pounds i believe he did and he also got a house furnished for him was that bill paid i do not remember is that document in your handwriting document handed in it is now having seen that document with your signature i ask you whether you were applied to to effect an insurance on the life of walter palmer i do not recollect not recollect when your signature is staring you in the face no i do not you are an attorney and accustomed to business transactions i am now i ask you again were you applied to on the subject i may have been it is from my memory i am speaking and wish therefore to speak as accurately as possible laughter i don't ask you as to your memory in the abstract but your memory now as is refreshed by that document is that your signature witness hesitating i have no doubt it may be look at that document and see whether you were not applied to to effect the insurance i have named that is my signature i ask you have you any doubt that in the month of january eighteen fifty five you were called upon to attest another proposal for thirteen thousand pounds on the life of walter palmer witness with hesitation i may have signed that paper in blank did you sign this proposal in blank i might have done but did you i ask again i cannot swear i did or did not i have some doubt whether i did not sign several of these proposals in blank sensation upon your oath do you not know that william palmer applied to you to effect an insurance for thirteen thousand pounds on the life of his brother i do not remember why this is a very large sum surely you must remember such a transaction as this i may have been applied to on the subject were you applied to to attest another proposal for an insurance with the universal life office i cannot say that i was will you swear that when walter palmer executed the deed of assignment of his policy to william palmer that you were not present now be careful for you will certainly hear of this on some future day if you are not careful i cannot say that i was upon your oath did you not attest the deed of assignment of walter to his brother of the interest in a policy of insurance for thirteen thousand pounds i cannot say i believe the signature jeremiah smith is very much like my handwriting i repeat the question i cannot say why did you not receive a check for five pounds for attesting it i think i did receive a check for five pounds did you not see william palmer write this upon the counterfoil of his cheque-book cheque-book handed to witness witness with hesitation i cannot positively swear that i did did you not sir see him write it that is william palmer's handwriting referring to the cheque-book did you not know that you got a five pound cheque for attesting that signature i may have got a cheque for five pounds but i may not have got it for attesting the signature of the document you say you got two hundred pounds for cook one hundred pounds from mrs palmer and one hundred pounds from william palmer 
yes and he gave me ten pounds for the recommendation to whom to william palmer do you not know that the two hundred pounds bill was given for the purpose of enabling william palmer to make up a sum of five hundred pounds i believe it was not for cook received absolutely from me two hundred pounds did he not have the money from you in order to take up to london to pay pratt no he took it with him i think to shrewsbury to the races who was the bill drawn in favour of i think william palmer what became of the bill i do not know witness i was not present at the inquest on cook i can't say who saw me when i went to the talbot arms and went into cook's room one of the servants gave me a candle either bond mills or lavinia barnes re-examined by mr sergeant she i have known mrs palmer twenty years i knew her before her husband's death i should say she is sixty years of age william palmer is not her eldest son joseph is the eldest he resides at liverpool he is forty-five or forty-six years of age i think george is the next son he lives at rugeley he was frequently at his mother's house there is another son a clergyman of the church of england he resided with his mother until within the last two years except when he was at college there is a daughter she lives with her mother there are three servants mrs palmer's family does not visit much in the neighbourhood of rugeley her house is a large one i slept in a room nearest the old church mr sergeant she is there any pretence for saying you have ever been charged with any improper intimacy with mrs palmer witness i hope not mr sergeant she is there any pretence for saying so witness there ought not to be mr sergeant she is there any truth in the statement or suggestion that you have had any improper intimacy with mrs palmer witness they might have said so but there is no reason mr sergeant she is there any truth in the statement witness i should say not mr sergeant she when did it come to your knowledge that there was a proposal for walter's life witness i never heard of it until the inquest the court then adjourned for about twenty minutes when the proceedings were resumed w joseph saunders was then called upon on his subpoena but did not appear the attorney-general said he should be extremely sorry to commence his reply if there was any chance of witness making his appearance mr sergeant she said he should now ask for the production of a letter written by cook to palmer on january the fourth eighteen fifty five the letter of which the following is a copy was then put in and read Quote, Lutterworth, January the 4th, 1855. My dear sir, I sent up to London on Tuesday to back St. Hubert for fifty pounds, and my commission has returned ten shillings and one penny. I have therefore booked two hundred and fifty to twenty five against him to gain money. There is a small balance of eighteen pounds due to you, which I forgot to give you the other day. Tell Will to debit me with it, on account of your share of training Pyrene. I will also write to him to do so, as there will be a balance due from him to me. Yours faithfully, J. Parsons Cook, W. Palmer, Esquire. End quote. Mr. Sergeant She submitted that he was entitled to reply on a part of evidence. The course taken by the Attorney General on getting at the contents of the cheque, the contents of an assignment of the policy on Walter Palmer's life, and the contents of the proposals to various offices for the insurance he submitted entitled him to reply on those points the lord chief justice we are of opinion that you have no right to reply mr baron alderson that is quite clear the attorney-general said he had been taken somewhat by surprise yesterday by the evidence of dr richardson with respect to angina pectoris dr richardson adverted to several books and authorities he had now those books in his possession and was desirous of putting some questions arising out of that part of the evidence the court decided against the application the case for the defence here concluded End of section 19.